sun's gonna come bursting through and I'm gonna look all pink because <laughs> the way this camera seems to handle the light is interesting. <clears throat> but praise the Lord. Looks like it's gonna be a beautiful day. It's warming up already. One of the things that I like about <clears throat> weather is that it's never the same. Every day it's <coughs> slightly different. No day, no two days are the same. There's always, like, at some point in time it seems like I get a cool breeze that comes blowing by, like right now. Some point in time in the day I get some sunshine. Some point in time in the day I get rain. Okay, maybe not every day, but anyways, you understand the point. But God causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the wicked and the good. He doesn't make a distinction between the two, but he rather causes some things to be equal to all. And you know, I like that about God because we are given the opportunity to grow up and to develop and become who we are in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Boy. <clears throat> there we go. You are not... Uh, when all you see is devastation. Does it seem like the world is falling apart? You are not the first person to feel this way. As the prophet Amos sat down to write the prophecies God had given him, his first words were, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. Amos 1-2. The days of Amos were like our days, and his message is to become ours. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Amos 3.8 In all the events taking place in the world today, the lion is roaring. The Lord is speaking through circumstance. And if you know the word of God, the message is very clear. Prepare to meet your God. Amos 4.12 these five words have been ringing in my heart. They are pealing from the bell tower of heaven, alerting us to the near coming of the Lord, calling us to repentance and prayer, warning us to prepare for the days ahead because the day of the Lord is so close at hand. The Bible tells us that what was written beforehand in the Old Testament was written for our learning and admonition so that through perseverance and encouragement we might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10 11 and Romans 15 4 it was the prophets of old who told us of the days and events which would usher in that debt that dreaded and terrible day of the Lord for surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants the prophets Amos 3 7 as in the days of Amos God is trying to get our attention through his divine judgments the earthquakes the floods the fires, the economy, the wars, and rumors of wars around the world. You yet, Amos says in 4.6, you have not returned to me. The prophet Amos sounds for us a call to repentance, to prayer, a cry from the throne of God through his prophet. Seek me that you may live, seek the Lord that you may live, for he will break forth like a fire, and it will consume with none to quench it. Let justice roll down like root. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you. Behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people. Amos 5, 4, 6, 24, 14, 7, and 8. <laughs> As God brought his judgments of locusts and fire out of control upon Israel, Amos interceded and the word tells us, the Lord changed his mind about this. Amos 7, 6. It's not too late. Earnest prayer uttered from repentant hearts vindicates God's justice when he, in mercy, spares his people. Like the nation of Israel, God has given our country special privileges because of our spiritual heritage and because we were, at one time, governed by leaders in a societal worldview permeated by the reverential fear of God. However, Special privileges bring special responsibilities, and with those responsibilities are neglected, we incur a greater judgment. Look at what has happened to nations who turn their back on the light God gave them. Take heed. If Israel, the chosen nation of God, was not exempt from the judgment of God, 
neither shall we be. God's divine and just judgment can only be averted by returning to the obedience of righteousness. What can you do? You must take you must make sure you are right with God. Get it together today. Ask him to cleanse your heart so you can lift up holy hands to him in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James 5.16. Pray and keep on praying, but don't stop there. Call others to repentance and prayer. Gather together, get on your knees, and wait before God. Then beseech him in prayer as he leads by his spirit. And keep on meeting until God breaks forth or until he tells you to stop praying. Until he tells you. Also, you need to invest your time and your money in activities and ministries which will reap eternal dividends. God told Amos that a day was coming when there would be a famine in the land for the hearing of the word of the Lord, and people will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Amos 8.12 As I read these verses, I'm reminded of what it's like in China, and in Russia, and in Romania, and other former communist countries, where there's been a famine for the word of God. Now that the doors have opened in some of these countries, all sorts of cults and pseudo-Christian charlatans have moved in. God's people there must learn how to study God's word themselves so they will have God's plumb line to check out all they hear and are taught. We must equip people to know God's word for themselves and thus to know God. As the saying goes, rather than give them fish, we want to teach them how to fish so they can feed themselves. Then when and if the day comes that there is a famine for the word of God in our country and elsewhere, there will be a multitude who will not only know their God and his word, but are able to stand and do exploits for him and to give bread and understanding to the famished. It is the mandate of the church to take those whom God saves and establish them in his word as that which produces reverence for him. Ask God what he would have you to do, then do it. As Amos says in 4.12, prepare to meet your God. You know, there is no doubt when you look about all the things that are happening in the world, as well as in your own family or in your own generations, of where we are, of what we are, and who we are. If you look back at the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and you begin to realize that there seems to be a pattern that's going on, one of giving in, and compromise. The family unit that used to be so adamant about teaching their children the way that they should go no longer has a father or a mother to teach them. When it was one time a one-person income family and the priority was to have a home, now it's a two-person family unit that is constantly working to provide entertainment for the children and for the family to go and play and do what they want to do. There's no longer a family unit that has a purpose and a design that God intended for them. What did God intend the family to be? Did you know that it was to be the bride, the body of Christ? That the family unit itself was to be a pattern of the church and Jesus? Does your family look like that? Mine never did. So, at some point in time, we have to recognize that this is the end of the world. You have to know that there is coming judgment, not just upon America, as we see how we have fallen away from those things that we once believed in and become something we don't believe in, but we are ignoring the reality of in our own personal lives. And that is, in the Christian world, we're not going to church because we want to meet God, but we're going to church because we want to be entertained, just like we want to be entertained by television, by worship, by music, by iPods, by games, by technology, even by sexual partners. The reality is, are you denying yourself at some point in time and following Jesus? Or are you just going after God to be entertained by him? One of the movies that's coming is going to be featuring you in it. It's called the tribulation period. God never intended for his church to go through it. God planned a way of escape that they'd be able to bear it. God chose in his word in the book of Revelation for one church to be spared from it. Do you know the word of God 
to be spared from that time? Or are you trusting in the entertainment factor of some book you read, of some church you went to, of some pastor that told you that all people, if you just call upon Jesus, will be saved and they'll be whisked away and magically taken to some other place? Do you know the Word of God to prove that to yourself? God help you. You need to read the book of Revelation and understand it for yourself. You need to read Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. Hear what Jesus would speak to you and understand it. Because the reality is, is when you stand before God, one-on-one, -on -one, nobody's going to stand with you. Jesus may be there, but what he may say, you may want to know now before you get there. The price of eternal salvation is a cost to us. It was given to us freely, but Jesus also made a requirement that we must do. And do you know what that is? That's why we study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why you should be going to church. That's why you should know the times that you live in are ending. It's going to be time to pay the piper. And I hope that that time doesn't find you unprepared. As Amos said, prepare to meet your God.